How would you like to learn about an important topic for leaders, competitive advantage, especially in these uncertain and changing times, with one of the foremost management thinkers of our time? That's exactly what I have for you today on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast in an episode recorded during our Virtual LeaderCon event. You can learn more at virtualleadercon.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is brought to you by Kevin's Daily Newsletter. The Daily Newsletter is a short email delivered Monday through Friday, written to inspire, engage, and focus you on becoming the best person and leader you can be. Learn more and sign up at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash daily. And now here's your host, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. and Welcome to the next session in Virtual LeaderCon. Welcome to another episode in the future of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I'm so glad you all are here. I'm so glad that my guest is here. We're going to talk today about competitive advantage. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about why that's the topic in just a second. Let me introduce this fine gentleman who is next to me on screen. His name is Ram Sharan. In his work with companies around the world, Ram Sharan is known for cutting through the complexity of running a business in today's fast changing environment to uncover the core business problem. Raise your hand if you want to know what to understand the core business problem. Uh, his real world solutions shared with millions through his books and articles and top business publications have been praised for being practical, relevant, and highly actionable. Uh, the kind of advice you can use on Monday morning. Uh, or any morning for that matter. His energetic uh, interactive teaching style has won him many awards, including the Bellringer Award at GE's famous Crotonville Institute and the Best Teacher Award at Northwestern. Uh, he has authored or co-authored more than 30 books, including the one we're going to talk a little bit about today, Rethinking Competitive Advantage, New Rules for Success in the Digital Age. Four of his books were Wall Street Journal bestsellers, including Execution, which he co-authored with Larry Bossidy, which spent more than 150 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It was titled Execution, but they couldn't execute it. It stayed. It just wouldn't go away. Uh, we all need a higher view. And a lot of us that have been here for the last few days in Virtual LeaderCon, we've, we've often been uh, at, a, at a lower level, thinking more personally, thinking more team. Today, we're going to take a higher level view, and we all need that. Ram, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I'm really looking forward to the session. It is a pleasure. And people know why should we focus total rethink on competitive advantage? Because first, there have been five changes. All of us buy at Amazon. They change the game. Why? First change, we have built our economy on mass marketing, mass production, mass advertising. What Amazon has done is to individualize. They know each of us, they know what we want, they predict. So the use of digital technology and algorithms and artificial intelligence is now we have market of one. That competition is different. Until recently, no one had the digital technology to service each of us separately, individually, uniquely. And that alone demands a different way to serve customers faster, better, cheaper, more convenient. This is the advent of new technology. The actual mathematics setting has existed for more than 200 years. It did not become possible until the computing power came in and until a catalyst like Jeff Bezos took all that and commercialized. It has been used since the war in the defense. It was used of landing the main and the moon and the, the Soviets. The technology of mathematics had existed since the 11th century application came from 1996 on. 
Which is an interesting lesson because the reality is that a lot of times it takes a long time to get from when we start to see something that could happen until it actually does happen. And uh, Ram is joining us from San Francisco this morning. I think I recognize the the place that you're at actually in the building behind you, as it turns out. Um, it's so the Marriott Hotel. That's what I actually thought. That looks like you the. You are right, spot. and I am in the lobby, beautiful, gorgeous, looking over the sea. So, so that's the hotel that opened like the week of the earthquake in 1989, and then they had mm. all kinds of problems because they that it wasn't even full yet, and they had people. Yeah, well, we don't need, that's not why we're here to talk about that. Um, right. We're here to talk about these new rules of competition and you outlined six in the book and it's not a test, but why don't you talk about um, some of those rules and then we'll dive into a couple of them. Yeah, Adrian, take one at a time. You pick so I can illustrate. You got them in front of you. All right. So you already hinted at the first one and we'll, I'm going to want us to dive in more about that to the personalized consumer experience. Um, yeah. You talked about algorithms and data being essential weapons. What do you mean by it that? Is. So let me say that. We are producing data every millisecond. So Amazon has data about every transaction you do. That data is massaged, re-massaged, re, -massaged, re -massaged, find your habits, give you the recommendations. So for example, I read a book on Kindle. It sends me a message, congratulations, you have read 30 pages. Here is a new book and it stimulate. It increases my knowledge. It's not a consumption, it's increasing my capacity. And so the second rule of competition. Algorithms and data. So as somebody on my team would say, yes, Kevin, there is math. Um, the third one says a company does not compete, its ecosystem does. Correct. Now you look at Amazon again, it's not only what they do, 68% of their revenues come from companies like Nike who sell on their platform. That's an ecosystem. No company in digital game will make return on capital unless they have an ecosystem. So, so, uh, and so that goes everything from the Nikes of the world and the Land's Ends of the world and all that, all the Correct. way down to the Kevin Eikenberry groups of the world. We've got a book that we self-published. We've got lots of books there that through our publishers, we got one book we self-published and we, and we sell it right there. We like send exactly. them books. It exactly. is a huge we, ecosystem, right? We now have, you're going to see it's just beginning, a 60 page book people can produce in 90 days. There you go. In 90 days, and put on Amazon as an ebook. You cut the cycle time. People can read a 60 page book in one hour. It has to be relevant. Its shelf life will be shorter. And that is coming. That, yeah, in fact, in many ways, that's already here. And so one of the challenges, you've written 30 books, I've written uh, quite a few as well. And one of the challenges is there's this long lead time between when we write it. And that's why I often ask authors, like, what have you learned since you wrote it? Sometimes even before it came out, by cutting the cycle time, we can change everything, right? Number so four Adrian, says, please. Adrian, Amazon management system, I was able to decipher it. I produced that in 10 weeks and put it on the market. Everybody who wants to know speed, who wants to know faster, better, cheaper, how Amazon makes decisions, read the book. There you go. It takes um, you 17 minutes to read it. 17 minutes. Seven zero. Seven zero. Seven zero. Thank you. Um, competitive, a new rule of competition number four. A money making is geared for huge cash generation, not earnings per share. And the new law of increasing returns. This is the major invention. That gap accounting, standard accounting is dead. It is the cash. It's the old way of managing business. Bezos popularized it. Microsoft Nadella uses it. Unless there is a fraud, you cannot misrepresent it. Cash is cash. Cash is an ammunition. Cash gives you discretion. So it's earnings cash. I have companies, I'm on the board, and I say the market value is created by the cash earnings of the company and the revenue growth. All that stuff. Now, see, you know what is happening? Is people saying EPS. Then they're saying EBIT, EBIT. 
Then yeah. they say EBITDA, EBI. Yeah. Now they are saying adjusted EBITDA. So what the hell is going on? <laughs> but cash is cash. No manipulation. Cash is cash, everybody. And I told you that I, I told you all that have been here with us along the way that we would take a higher level view. But we're gonna we're gonna bring this all back down before we're done. Number five, people. Th this one might be my favorite, actually. Uh, people, culture, and work design form a social engine that drives innovation, execution, personalized for each customer. So talk about that, that interconnection, yes. that is huge. social engine. This is a huge point. Number one, the creator of business are people. It's not business itself. Leaders create that. Leaders destroy that. Number two, only talent creates innovation. It doesn't happen on its own. It could be an individual, it could be a team, it could be a company, it could be a collaboration among companies like it happens in the case of vaccines. We cut eight year cycle time to one year. And so the competitive advantage is you, I, others, talent. It's nothing else. If Steve Jobs comes back, look what he did. Satya Nadella becomes CEO, look what has he done. Look at Tim Cook, post Steve Jobs, what has he done? It is the leadership, it is the talent that drives the innovation. Each of us who are in this audience today say you make a difference. Figure out your God-given gift and find the corridor where you can deploy it. Hone it, practice it. That's what we do in sports. Sports, a tennis player is no good in baseball. Okay, I've got to stop right there. I don't know if anyone saw, but the 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 MMA fighter dude, what is his name? Is McGregor was apparently threw out the first pitch at a ball game last night, and like he's the best MMA fighter or whatever in the world. He couldn't hit the ball; it went like thirty feet on the other side of the of the catcher. So you, yeah. we can be great at one thing; yeah. it doesn't mean we're going to be great at it all, right? Yeah, but discover what you are and keep searching where it fits. This is the secret of success. And don't give up because you failed once or twice, but keep learning, get a coach. Olympic champions are highly focused. Same in business. I keep telling the CEOs, would you have hired Steve Jobs when he was young? And their jaw drops. Would you have hired Jeff Bezos? Jaw drops. Would you have hired Bill Gates? Jaw drops. There were nobodies. Yeah, they put a Steve Jobs on a 2 a.m. night shift. I met their boss, his boss. Tim Cook was in a compact 3% margin business doing a low level job of, of logistics. So I talked to his boss, who's a friend of mine, and I said, how come he went with the Steve Jobs in 1996? He said, he said, I'll take a chance on this man. That's how Tim Cook came to Steve Jobs in 1996, 1997. And look what has he done. Find the talent. Each of you have a talent. Do not in any way miss your calling and do not in any way degrade yourself. Every human being has a raw talent. Discover it. And that leads us to the sixth competitive principle, which is really tied to what you're just saying. But I want to, you can extend it from there. We, if we have that talent, great. Now hear the sixth principle. Leaders continually learn, imagine, and break through obstacles to create change that other companies then must contend with. So here it is that in my work of 50 years, God knows how many CEOs, companies in Brazil, China, Japan, all over the place that I've been working. You know, I'm on a board of a Chinese company, very large and so on and so on. They have this incessant learning, is the insatiable appetite to discover three words, what is new. Practice it. You don't know things, learn. So one of the things I see in people like the Bezos, they are pinpointing the hurdle they're facing very precisely. And then they never let it go. They go, as they say, to the end of the earth to find someone who will help them solve. 
because they know they can't solve everything. Well, before and they experiment and they experiment and they learn. So Bezos has 18 failures. I have a list of those. 18, one eight. And yet it's very cash rich. I mean, the company is very cash rich. Yeah. They know if you're going to invent something, some will fail, but we can sustain the failure. But more importantly, you learn from that. When we do drug discovery, this is whole design in a way that how do we test will the body accept it? Will it be toxic? And they know it's an experiment and they design the experiment that way and there will be failures. America is number one in the world in this area. No number two. I lived in these countries. I've gone to the companies in various countries deep inside. Have yeah. self-confidence. In the, in the fifth uh, rule, people, culture, and work design, I, I want to have you talk a little bit more about culture. We, you, you sort of unpacked a bit about leadership as it relates to that. But like, what are you seeing in, in those top performing companies? What are the things that will give us competitive advantage around culture? Yeah. So if you look at culture. The culture is people may have a hard time describing, but when you see one, you know one. Take Apple. What's this culture? Perfect product for the consumer. They charge high price, high margin. They're able to compete with the low price cell phones across the globe, even though those cell phones sell large numbers. But theirs, even that particular country buys the Apple phones. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. product, service, that's culture. So I've, I've talked to a number of people. We've talked a lot this week about culture, you know, sort of at the, uh, at the micro level. You're talking about it at the macro level. And I think it's important for us to think about it both ways, right? To think about it in terms of what does that mean? And what is the, how does that translate out into the marketplace, which is what you're saying. Which I think but yes, really this one, as I suggested, it's a high price, high margin and everybody wants it and they take it 1.6 billion phones and and by the way in case you missed the math everybody uh high margin gives you a much better chance to get more cash cash generation which of course we now know that cash is king right? and, and adrian a large part of that cash is available for new innovation so now they are doing the innovation on watches, what the watches do. They're measuring your health measures. It now does EKG. You don't have to go to the doctor. It gives you an alert. It will measure blood sugar. Same technology applied differently and using data. So they have a use of data, what, what you use on the telephone. Now watch your health data and help you become better. And we heard yesterday, I don't have one, as you can see. Uh, I learned yesterday that you can use your phone to remember to breathe. Now, Ram, I don't know why I need to remember to learn how to breathe, but but people, you can use, your point is, we can use our watch for all sorts of things besides looking at the time, just like we oh, use our yeah, phone yeah. for all Look, sorts of things besides making yeah, a phone call. Yeah, let me explain to you one thing. In 1970s, 80s, Bill Gates announced the price of voice on the phone will be zero. The price of measuring time on the watch is zero. Is the rest of it. Yep. Make us healthy before you get sick. Preventative health. That's Apple. High margins, high price, high profit, high cash, more money for innovation. And customer benefits. So, so Ram, I know that you spend a lot of your time working at the highest levels in organizations with CEOs, with, 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 with C level teams. No, I go or, to the bottom of the organization also. That's where I begin. Yeah. Go ahead. That, no, that's what, what I want to ask is, I, you know, what is your message, whether it's from the book or in general, what is your message for managers or leaders in the middle? 
Uh, yes, how I can have, we apply have, these ideas if we're not yeah, in this? I team? have very clear message. You know, I have a number of books on that on middle management. Every single manager must practice three things, regardless wherever you are, first level supervisor all the way to CEO. You are no good unless you make your people successful. It's not about you. It's about the people who are working with you. I use the word with you. People report to you, people who are your peers, people who are your vendors, people who are your customers. You get up every morning, as one of the CEOs taught me, he said, first thing in the morning he does after cleaning up, how do I use my day the best? Spend those 10 minutes. And your mantra is, how do I make people around me more successful? What's the things I can do? They succeed, I succeed. They grow, I grow. It is not fluff, it's real. Yeah, it is not fluff, it is real. There's no doubt about that. Um, they will help you get your KPIs. They will help you get your results. You will get joy when somebody is getting better. And remember, this is an old principle people don't do. And that is recruit people better than yourself. Be secure because people who recruit people better than yourself are very few people. They talk, but they don't do. And third is that no matter where you are, be honest with your people, give them honest feedback right on the spot in a constructive way. That feedback is usually less than 60 seconds. People will die for you. Practice it like the athlete. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, oh, uh, enjoy when someone gets better. Or got re, got re, re commented. See, I oh. get this joy. <clears throat> I started many, many people coaching, working with them, solving their problems at the age of 27, 28. And they become the CEO of the largest companies in the world. That gives me enormous joy. Yeah. Happened at Ford, happened at Verizon. Yeah. These are large companies. I took them under my wing when they were 27, 20 years of age. <clears throat> um, so I, I, um, I want to make sure, by the way, if any of you, uh, I, I know that many of you who are watching are like me and you're like fur furiously taking notes. But if any of you have questions you want to ask, of course, please put them in, You know how to do it. Put them in the chat. Uh, make sure that we know. And we'll <laughs> ask Ram those questions. Because when he and I were in the green room, he said, yeah, we'll answer whatever people ask. So if you anything, them, anything, anything, if I don't know the answer, I will convert into my native language Hindi. <laughs> and then we'll just think you're even wiser. You see, that's how that works. So we'll give you all a, a chance to think of the questions you want to ask, and I'll ask another one. So, so Ram, you're a part of this, this day, and I know that this is going to come out as a podcast later. We've got folks. Uh, from all over that are with us today. And, and so I'm going to ask this question this way. What's something that you would encourage all of us to do tomorrow? Because today, they're gonna, many of them are going to be here live. So what, what, whether it's today or tomorrow, what's, what's the next thing we should do? Yeah, what I want everyone to do tomorrow and every day. First, how to get the best out of your day. And the second, have a diet of reading in the morning to see what is new that you did not know yesterday. What is new will expand your capacity. Search it. Whether it's relevant for you or not doesn't matter. Mind, brain has unlimited capacity. And then talk to somebody during the day, during the week, this is what you saw. By talking, you learn more with somebody else. That is one of the principles, everybody, about why we're here and why you guys are saying the things you're saying in the chat. We've got a couple of questions, Ram, and I'm going to get to those in just a second. For all of you that have been with us a couple of days, you certainly hear 
the, the thread about reading. I've got a question for you, Ram. Then I'm going to get to the ones in the chat, which I haven't even opened up yet. Here's the question. You've worked with lots of high-level leaders. How many, what percentage of those would you say aren't readers? High-level, less than 1% who are not readers. That's what I figured. <laughs> This was America before this whole online stuff. People will take books, have book reading sessions in the Midwest. Everybody I've known who didn't go to a Harvard, they are avid readers and searchers of data. If Bill Gates at the age of 18 going to a small shop, getting the IBM manual and devouring it. His reading, you all know how much he reads. Yeah. Um, it's no secret. Famously, Warren Buffett as well, right? Among others. Uh, he is one, on the planet. No, I can tell you because I know him. I've seen him for 12 years. He is the only one on the planet who has the best finger pulse on what is happening across the industries in the world. I'd match anybody against him because I know what he does. That's and awesome. then he has his vice chairman whose logic is stronger than Warren's. He doesn't talk much, but I've sat against right in front of him and the logic he uses, I've never met a person with that logical mind. And he's very courteous. Uh, he doesn't show his superiority. He will engage with you as if he was your equal. Charlie Munger. So, so yeah, Charlie Munger. So um, here's a question that comes in from Ireland. Aiden asks this, Ram, is there one attribute that you see in a 27-year-old that makes you think they will become a great leader? Now, remember, a great leader is not a great leader. A leader that fits in the situation makes him great. Okay. So are there anything specific? Yeah, that says a sim no, no, you got to search because the complexity is high. And Eisenhower can run the war, but they did not choose Patton, and people say it's correct. And Oppenheimer for atomic bomb was not the rocket scientist. He was a leader. So you got to fit the situation, what the situation demands. So you look at an individual, if you want to look at some science, the first part of a leader is, can this person get the best out of people and grow them at the same time. Without excellent. that, you cannot be a leader. That's excellent. So another question comes in and it says, do you see any consistent daily habits from people you see as successful? Obviously you've already talked about reading, of course, daily learning, but I'm wondering if you've noticed any other trends. Yes, yes, yes. The key point is, this is what I call the power of compound interest. If you practice something daily, and every time a little inch better, an inch better, an inch better, because the mind and the brain have unlimited capacity. And so the CEO level, they practice the consistency of judgment, which is a rare quality. Become aware of the biases and become aware more what they don't know, they need to know. You know, I, I'm, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you uh, say a number of things that seem to me to boil down to wisdom. Comment about the word wisdom. Yeah. Say it again. Do you have any? Do you have any thoughts about? I, I said a lot of the things that that you've been saying. I, I keep coming back to the word wisdom. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your thought about that? You know, you talked about knowledge. You talked about understanding your biases. You talked about, you, you talked about judgment. I, I was coming back to wisdom. Comments, thoughts about that word wisdom. Yeah, you see, the, the key part is that any wisdom is true in certain circumstances. It's not through other circumstances. The old one, don't fix if it ain't broke. Today, you better fix even though it's not broke. Okay. Um, another question that came in, it says, can you comment on a younger generation 
who wants to be promoted quickly to the next level. Why not? What are we talking? How old was Bill Gates? 18. Steve Jobs, 18. What's wrong with that? But they, if they, if they are learning well, applying well, they're growing faster and they deserve it. And therefore the old fuddy duddies have to come to terms. Yeah, it's gotta be, you're saying it's about what deserved, not about some sequence or some time. No, no, no nothing, nothing. Why not? You have the 5,000 startups in America. Many of them are very young. Why not? Because they can download the digitization free of charge and get a variable cost AWS. Why not? Yep. So, um, so my point is in forget the age, forget I, the chronological age, look at the mental maturity. The older I get, I hope that that applies at the top end, Ram, as well as at the bottom end. Anywhere, um, anywhere. <laughs> um, so uh, I, again, if anyone else has a question, please put those in. By the way, on the old age in, Charlie Munger is over 90. He's as young as you ever find. Yeah. Douglas says maturity isn't a function of age, which is which is an excellent point. So I'm going to ask you a question that I don't know. You've probably not been asked on this kind of a venue before. Um, you're, you're talking, extolling the value of reading and making that a part of your day. And I'm right with you on that. What's something that you're reading now? I don't care what in what area. Like what's something you're reading right okay. now? I am, because of my work, a, a devotee about judgment. Because at the CEO level, it doesn't matter how much analysis you have done, how many advisors you got. At the end of the day, you're going to make a decision that's judgment. And that's where I come in to help them calibrate their judgment. I have done for the CEOs to be able to say it very privately alone and say, sir, your judgment is wrong. Now that's, if I am doing the right thing, that's very precious to them. Absolutely. Uh, I did uh, that with Jack Welch once. I was just standing in Washington in the private hangar. He was coming out with his bodyguards and he, um, he split said hello to me. He knows me very well. And uh, I said, Jack, I heard you doing this. He said, yes. I said, Jack, you're dead wrong. It's a Friday afternoon. He said, come to my office Monday morning, 8 o'clock. I go in there, talk to him. Three executive VP sitting there. Six months later, he called me back and said, reverse my judgment. Now, it was private. He trusted my question. He knew I'm not selling consulting. He knew that I can be trusted to, to ask that question it was a very important decision. And the judgment issue, Adrian, is for everyone, not just for the CEOs. The greatest judgment every leader must exercise from bottom to the top is judgment on people. Who, 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 we, who, we, who we have, who we want, who we keep, right? Who we, who we grow. Um, so if, if we wanted to work on our judgment at, from a reading perspective, Ram, what would you recommend? Find the central idea from the book, write it down, think about it, and then say, how would I improve it? How does it apply, not apply? Not necessarily to me, to anybody. Say, for example, this morning, there's an announcement that EPA is going to create some kind of a, 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 a regulation to, to, to prohibit hydrocarbon for the filling the, 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 uh, the uh, various things. It's a fluid. That's a key part of the, of the uh, environment issue. So it's okay, this is a new thing, it's going to be done. Whom does it matter for? And every company uses this in some way or the other. This is in the air conditioners. Yeah. Build your mind. 
Now, this one I picked up online because you don't have to read the book, you pick information online. Perfect. Today, most books are getting obsolete in one year. Yeah. And nobody reads 300 pages books anymore. That's true. Uh, that is true. And even if they do, it's on their Kindle. They don't even know how long it was when they started because you can't tell, right? You can't, you can't tell. tell very easily. Um, so I want to I, I, I want to see. Oh, we've got some other questions that have come in. So let me just open those up and see what we've got. Uh, let's see. Um, so the question is, considering the Peter principle where someone is promoted to their incompetent level and the Dunning-Kruger effect that cognitive bias causes people with low ability to overstate their skill, how do you find the sweet spot in your career? Yeah, number one, you do take a risk and get a stretch assignment or going up. If you're not succeeding, don't be negative on yourself. You're going to learn something. No champion in sport ever became a champion without taking the knocks. No famous actor became a famous actor and durable without taking the knocks. A large number of CEOs took knocks in their early careers, got fired. Perfect. So you got Carol, to experiment, oh. you go to search. Carol asks, as the world changes so quickly, what are the best, most time effective resources to keep current? Do you have some that you use regularly, regularly or consistently? You pick the ones you like so long they're externally oriented. Economists. Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, simple, but learn how to get the best out of them in short period of time. Perfect, perfect. I have a question for you, sir. We've been talking about, we know how much you love your work. We know how much you're enmeshed in the work that you do, that it's a part of who you are. I am personally curious, what do you do for fun? That's not about- this is it. I don't do anything, I just have fun. I love that. I love that. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. No, it's real. It's totally real. Last question. Um, if you could whisper in our ears, leaders from around the world this morning, what would you tell us? I'll say it again. In, say it again. I said, if you could whisper in our ears today, the middle of September, 2021, as leaders, what's the one thing you'd want to tell us? Yeah. The world is going to offer, it's offering now, tremendous new opportunities ride the wave. Ride the wave. Next three years, you count on it, 5% real GDP growth in America. I give you that in writing. There'll be some bumps. It does not happen for decades. We're going to lead. That's where we're going to leave it, everybody. Ram, thank you so much for being here. Such a pleasure to have you, to have the chance to interact with you, to learn from you. And uh, everybody in the chat, give some love to Ram before we send him away. Uh, the link below will tell you how you can get all the resources to him. If you're watching later, listening on the podcast later, we'll have all those resources for you as well. Ram, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day in San Francisco. Thank you, Aiden. And anytime, call me whenever you want me. Thank you.